In part three of our series of videos on deductive arguments, we're going to look at some tips for interpreting arguments in ordinary language to try to figure out what their logical structure is. The logical forms that we've looked at before and defined are defined in their simplest possible aspect. So you can come up with what are called substitution instances of all of those argument forms where hypothetical syllogism, for example, is defined as if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. You could think of the argument form hypothetical syllogism as that pattern of operators in the premises and the conclusion. So you have um, two premises that have the conditional or if then, and you have your conclusion that has the if then. And in addition to the pattern of operators, there's a pattern of propositions that appear in the argument form. Um, however, you can think of the definitions we give of the argument forms like hypothetical syllogism as giving the simplest possible case where we define it with P, Q, and R. You can substitute more complex propositions, compound propositions, for these simple propositions given in our definition of the form. So even though we defined hypothetical syllogism as if P then Q, if Q then R, and therefore if P then R, this example, if P then not Q, if not Q then R, therefore if P then R, it still fits the overall form of hypothetical syllogism. Instead of the simple proposition Q in the consequent of our first proposition, our first premise, and in the antecedent of our second premise, we have the compound proposition not Q. However, this argument still has the same pattern of operators and the same pattern of propositions as the argument form in general. We've just replaced the simple proposition Q with a compound proposition not Q. If we substitute out propositions consistently like that, then we can retain the argument form. This is still a valid instance of hypothetical syllogism. Let's look at the ordinary or the natural language example of this. If the murder was committed at noon, then the butler did not do it. If the butler did not do it, then the maid must have done it. Therefore, if the murder was committed at noon, then the maid must have done it. We can um, see that in this case, the negation is there in the natural language example. Note that um, you can use any operator in your substitution instance. In this case, it's a negation. Another example of this could be if P, then Q or S. If Q or S, then R. Therefore, if P, then R. The only rule is that once we make a substitution for one of the propositions in our argument form, we have to make a similar substitution for each time in the form that proposition would occur. So be on the lookout for more complex substitution instances of the argument forms. The most common one is like this, where you have one or more negations added to the basic argument form. Another tip for interpretation applies to when you're looking at arguments in um, natural language especially in ordinary language contexts when there's not an especial amount of care being given for the structure of the argument or how it's expressed. There's a lot of variation that happens in natural language, especially in ordinary language context. Um, so an example is where the word if appears in the middle of a statement or proposition, like P if Q. If you see um, a proposition of the form P if Q, it has the same logical meaning as if Q then P. The if is an indicator of the antecedent of a conditional, even if the if appears in the middle of a grammatical sentence. So here's an example. Your team will earn extra credit if you got the question right. That's logically equivalent to if you got the question right, then your team will earn extra credit. So be able to um, swap the order of the sentence when you write it into uh, your logical notation because you don't want to confuse the antecedent with the consequent. Uh, 
if Q then P is not equivalent to if P then Q. But it is common um, in natural language like English to have the if occur in the middle of the grammatical sentence. Another common phrasing of the conditional is only if. So only if does not have the same meaning as if by itself. If by itself, whether it's at the beginning of a sentence or in the middle, is going to indicate the antecedent of the conditional, what we ordinarily think of as the if clause. Only if actually indicates the consequent. So if you see a statement that has the form P only if Q, what that is saying is if P then Q. So you could think of only if as serving a similar function to the word then. It indicates the consequent of the conditional. For example, your team will earn extra credit only if you got the question right. That means if your team earns extra credit, then you got the question right. And finally, let's look at the word unless. The simplest way of interpreting unless is as the uh, disjunction or or. P unless Q could be translated as P or Q. However, it's also logically equivalent to two conditional propositions. How you interpret it or translate it um, will vary based on what argument form you're fitting with this particular argument. So some of the argument forms are defined using the disjunction or other argument forms are defined using the conditional if then. So it'll be based on the context of the overall argument structure, which of these is preferable. They are logically equivalent in meaning, but to make your interpretation of the argument fit a valid argument form, you may have to choose one of these or another. So the two conditionals are if not P then Q or if not Q then P. And it may not seem like it, but those are actually logically equivalent propositions. Here's an example. Your team will earn extra credit unless you got the question wrong. One way of interpreting that is if you did not get the question wrong, then you will earn extra credit. And perhaps you can see when it's phrased that way, it makes intuitive sense why we would interpret the word unless in that fashion. Now let's look at a sample problem that illustrates some of the issues that can come up with when you're trying to interpret an argument in ordinary language and put it into um, either a more formal or a completely symbolic form to identify the logical argument form. In ordinary language contexts, there can be additional statements in a passage that aren't part of the argument. The phrasing can be non-standard, like having if in the middle of the sentence. Um, and there can also be cases where we have substitution instances of the argument form. That can occur in both ordinary language and non-ordinary language contexts. But because of the uh, variety of expression possible in ordinary language, i.e. not in our formal symbolic language, um, we have to be especially on the lookout for variant ways of expressing logical ideas. So let's read this passage and see if we can identify uh, the logical structure of the argument. In January 1610, Galileo pointed a new telescope at Jupiter. He noticed three points of light beside Jupiter that weren't visible with his other weaker telescopes. At first, he thought they were stars, but as he wrote in his notes, he reasoned that if they were stars, then they should be about as bright as the other stars and arranged randomly like the other stars. But they were brighter than the other stars and arranged in a straight line next to Jupiter. Thus, he concluded they were not stars. This was his first step in discovering the moons of Jupiter. So this is a somewhat lengthy, complex passage, especially if you're new to logic. Uh, a nice place to begin is just to try to identify the conclusion of the argument. We see we have the conclusion indicator word thus. So generally that's going to indicate the conclusion. It even has the phrase he concluded after. So both of those together are conclusion indicators. Um, now let's identify the logical operator terms in the argument. I put in red all of the logical terms. We have an if then, and we have two ands and a not. Um, 
So one thing to remember is that the logical forms that we're learning in this course, none of them involve the word and. However, um, if you study logic uh, at greater length, you will find rules that do use and. Um, and it is a logical concept. So that's why I've highlighted it here, just to remind us that it can have a logical use. So once we've identified the logical operator terms, the next step is to try to identify the simple propositions. So what is the first simple proposition that appears in this argument? Now you might have thought that the first sentence was the first simple proposition. In January 1610, Galileo pointed a new telescope at Jupiter. However, if you tried to interpret that as part of the argument, you would see it would not fit any logical argument form. So this is maybe skipping ahead a bit in terms of where you would naturally start if you were working on this problem on your own. But it turns out the first simple proposition that's actually part of the argument is they were stars. Um, we can use S to symbolize that simple proposition. Now, um, when you're not sure yet what the logical form of the argument is, it's very easy to think that part of the passage is part of the argument when it's not. If this happens, you can still correct it later on because you realize uh, you'll have extra propositions that don't fit any logical argument form and don't seem to work with other propositions. So that's how you can rule them out as not really being parts of the argument. You'll also notice another clue is that our first logical operator word, if, only occurs in the third, or sorry, the fourth sentence of the argument. So that's a clue, that's where the argument begins. It's not an absolute clue, but in this case, it is a reliable indicator. So what is the next simple proposition that is in this argument? They should be about as bright as the other stars. We're using the letter S to symbolize they were stars and the capital letter B to symbolize the simple proposition, they should be about as bright as the other stars. Um, and you'll notice this proposition does not occur again in that wording in this passage. So we ask ourselves, what is the next simple proposition in this argument? A couple of things um, should pop out. We have the proposition arranged randomly like the other stars. I've put that in purple to indicate it's a different argument, a different proposition, and I'm symbolizing it with the capital letter R. Now, one thing I have highlighted here are two other simple propositions, seemingly, that occur in the next sentence. And at first, you might think they're different propositions. They should be about as bright as the other stars. They were brighter than the other stars. Arranged randomly like the other stars versus arranged in a straight line next to Jupiter. This is a really nice illustration of the variety of expression that is available in ordinary language that can obscure the logical form of the argument. So in fact, they were brighter than the other stars is the negation of the original simple proposition. They should be about as bright as the other stars. If you think about it, to say that they were brighter means that they were not as bright as the other stars. This is just a different way of expressing that logical idea of the negation. Similarly, saying that they were arranged in a straight line is the same as saying they were not arranged randomly. So you have to really kind of use your interpretive skills to figure out it's the same simple proposition. We just have a hidden negation. Now I wasn't able to put the negation in red as a logical operator because it's kind of present in the whole clause and the way that the words are used, straight line versus random, brighter than as bright as. So they're actually negating each other logically. Okay, so now that we have our simple propositions identified, we should go on and identify the logical form of the argument or start to build that together, put that together. Um, this is one of those cases where we're left with several sentences in our passage that are not part of the argument. And like I said before, you might initially suspect that they were part of the arguments. Look at the last sentence. This was his first step in discovering the moons of Jupiter. That sentence is after the conclusion. However, there can be uh, parts of the argument um, given after the conclusion. 
when it's present in an ordinary language context because ordinary language is flexible. Conclusion can be put at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. However, in this case, that sentence, this was his first step in discovering the moons of Jupiter, it is a proposition, but it's not part of the argument. So what's going on with all those extra propositions? Well, they're giving context and background information, but they're not logically connected to the argument itself. So we have the basic structure of the argument presented there. Let's put it into the purely symbolic form too. So the logical structure is if S then B and R, not B and R, therefore not S. You'll notice that we have to introduce parentheses in our logical symbols to indicate that the main operator of the first premise is the horseshoe or the if then. All of B and R together belong after the then, so they are all part of the consequent of that conditional. That's why we have to group them together with parentheses. Similarly, if you look at the meaning of the second premise, it's negating the conjunction of B and R. It's saying they were brighter than the other stars and arranged in a straight line next to Jupiter. So it's saying it's false. It's not the case that they are as bright as the other stars and that they are arranged randomly. Now there's actually more than one way of interpreting that second premise. Um, it's actually negated. You could interpret it as negating both of those simple propositions individually. However, uh, the logical sense of the argument, it's using the negated conjunction rather than the conjunction of negations. And finally, our conclusion is not S or tilde S. They were not stars. So what argument form does this fit? It's a bit more of a complex substitution instance than the generic argument form, but hopefully you can still see the pattern. It's a modus tollens argument. One premise is a conditional, in this case, if S, then B and R. Another premise is a negation of the consequent of that conditional. It's not the case that B and R. And our conclusion is the negation of the antecedent. This is a substitution instance of modus tollens, but it still has the same general logical form, so it fits the argument.